All right, how you guys doing? We're going over the whole indie weekend so far. I'll talk IRP in the trucks and get that out of the way pretty quickly. Same thing with um, Xfinity, and then we'll mainly focus on Cup, but I doubt I'm going to say much that'll really lean anything uh, towards any certain direction. So when we start looking at IRP for the truck series, just a refresher of what we did last year, went green. Uh, for a majority of the race, when we look back at even with how the cup, even how the truck series runs at short tracks, pretty green race. I don't foresee anything truly happening that was different than what happened last year. Probably a good amount of people running the lap down. I don't envision a lot of wrecks, a lot of people being, being taken out. I just don't see that being the case. When we look at the top of where everybody is in terms of the truck series contest at short tracks, and just very quickly, these are the tracks being used in this, which. Bristol, you know, being used, whatever, that, that's fine. I'm not really concerned about it. it. It's very difficult to envision Christian Eckes or Corey Hyman not being the truck that dominates, not being the run who, not being the one who truly controls the race. Real chance that the leader is able to pull away on the top line and establish a gap pretty big enough to not lose any positions on pit lane once the stages end. Okay, and so I'm not really concerned about the leader outside of speeding losing the lead on pit lane and so good chance that one Eckes and Corey Heim one Eckes or Corey Heim um, start up front but even when we look at last year's race like Eckes and I you know probably a situation where I was probably on Eckes last year you know Eckes did start first last year and get passed by Majeski. now Majeski had a better car but I I would find it very unlikely that Eckes does not start in one of the top two positions, and same thing with Corey Heim. Like I, which whichever one of these guys starts in the top two, I'm probably going to lean towards these guys just based on the tracks we've seen and how they've been running this year. Past that, it's going to be you know whatever place differential stuff or whatever place differential plays come through. Um, I just envision this being a pretty much a one lap leader type of race. I don't see multiple people leading. I don't see the leaders swapping the lead a lot in this race. I just see one guy running away with it, very similar to what Ty um, Majeski did last year. And I think Eckes and, and Heim are those two main guys past that. And we're just going to go with, you know, whatever guy is looking like, you know, a place differential play that should come through. And one thing that I do want to note, I know we're at IRP for for this race and the other two are at Indy, but real chance that we're going to have fast cars start in the back at IRP. When we look at the starting grid last year, I do believe we had Majeski or somebody we had some good cars in the back last year that, you know, Ankrum, you know, ends up being, if I'm not mistaken, he was the one who was spun by Hosevar, but I could be wrong. I could have swore that was 91 car, but I just could, my memory could just be wrong. Uh, but when we look back at where people were last year due to getting in the wall, because you have to run by the wall here, just how it is, you that's how you keep people from passing. That's uh, I mean, that's where you end up running at. Okay, and so more than likely we're going to have cars get sideways and, and throw the rear end into the, into the wall in practice and not take a queue time, very similar to last year. Um, so keep that in mind. I, I would probably feel more comfortable chasing place differential in this race, especially with the likelihood that one guy truly runs away with the race. I mean, when you look back at last year, Majeski, Corey Heim, and Eckes were the three guys who only led laps. They started up front, one, two, three. Very similar situation this year to where those three guys have been the best guys. You know, throw in finger in there as well, but still, in terms of more consistency, it's been Majeski, Heim, and Eckes. Like, I I think this is a pretty good indication of how this race is going to go from a starting position to where you have the guys who have been fast starting up front. Probably going to have to pick between one of them. I would not pick two drivers here. And then probably whatever place differential is being forced, fed to us due to them getting into the wall. That That's how I would uh, approach IRP, and that's not really you know anything out of the ordinary. When we look at the Xfinity series at Indy this weekend, and we look at the fact that we don't have any Cup Series guys in this race, thank Christ alive. Um, so everybody's priced pretty decently. You know, there's not one true guy that's drastically too expensive because we don't have a Cup guy. We don't have anything like that. When we look at the bottom of the salary, I just want to say that. Uh, BJ is in the MBM 13 car, but I also want to add that when we look at like JD Motorsports exodus from the Xfinity series, like dude, good riddance. Okay, the the days of underdogs, the days of actually caring about these guys are like, like it's over. Okay, stop wanting 
the you know these small teams even survive and are being in there like the reason why they're filing bankruptcy is because like why would you invest why would you do this as a full-time job if you are like dirt poor okay you could have a phenomenal late model program uh, but instead you're running like ass last in Xfinity. we had not been playing jd motorsports consistently outside of plate races you know and even then smithley was like you know a de facto, like, oh, I guess we'll play him here and there. But, like, we, we weren't playing the JD Motorsports cars. They weren't running three to four cars like they were in years prior. It was two to one. Okay, and so, like, good riddance. Okay, get him out of here. Who cares? Okay, and yet again, we're not even going to notice it because Alpha Beta Prime bought the points from the JD Motorsports number four car, and now they could just run Greg Van Alst and watch him absolutely destroy everybody uh, in this race. Like, it, it's not going to have any impact on the racing whatsoever. Like, get rid of these slower teams. Like, it's, it's not a big deal, okay? We're going to see absolutely no impact on this whatsoever, okay? They're already down to one car anyway, two cars here and there on certain races. Like, it, it's not a big deal, okay? This is not the four-car team everybody thinks of with the Flex Seal sponsorship from, like, 10 years ago, okay? Um, when we look at this race here, thankfully, Pocono is an identical racetrack to how things should play out. Okay, and this is because the tunnel turn is, the, is in Indianapolis corner. Like, who cares about that? We're just focusing on where people should end up falling in line at. Okay, and last week, you know, the only thing that made an impact on the race was pit lane. And the guy's speeding on the final pit stop. Okay, because past that, it was very much, you know, not even very much Cole Custer. It, it was very much like we understood where everybody was in terms of speed. It just so happened that William Byron has a tire go down on a restart. We have Justin Allgaier who gets the uncontrolled tire or pit crew interference on pit lane that also pushes him through the rear. What happened in both those situations? Byron and Allgaier, although it takes forever because it's Pocono, they were able to drive up through the field. Okay, by de facto of them not being up there to contend for the lead, the third favorite car of the weekend, Cole Custer, became, you know, the dominant factor. And then, you know, Austin Hill, like when we ranked them last week, we understood that it was very much Byron Allgaier who had the best car, you know, and then drastically different and down the line, Cole Custer, Austin Hill, like guys who are only competing for wins or only competing for the lead if we're losing two of the major favorites in these races. That's exactly what happened. But when we look at where people are at, Allgaier, and I would push it towards, especially in a situation like this to where just de facto they're ranked second and third, Allgaier and Byron are ranked the second and third best cars in a race where they had to drive through the field. Okay, so if anything, that makes Allgaier and Byron, I would argue, the better cars than Cole Custer. Cole Custer just, you know, has the data in that race because he was up front and stuff. Either way, three favorites there. Austin Hill, you know, right where he should be. We'll get reports to see, you know, I, I, I'm i going to be frank. I have not rewatched this. I have no idea what happened to Sieg. I, I'm just assuming that he had a terrible pit strategy at the end of the race because him finishing like in the twenties or wherever this this poor fella finished, I I I don't I was I was so concerned I had the wrong year I was so concerned with like oh my gosh Jesse Love and Herbst are gonna go a lap down because they both had a horrific speeding penalty and then we get in the green white checker and then we you know restart and stuff and I'm like what the heck happened to to Ryan Sieg. Let's see where did where did Ryan? Oh, he ended up finishing twelfth. There's there's a real point to where, you know, Ryan was was very much in the twenties entering the end of that race. It was it was absolutely wild after running basically sixth all day, and so when we look at you know the Indianapolis race for the Xfinity series, I would very much look at this data. This is where everybody should be at. It is a situation of, and you know, with Jesse Love like starting where he was at his price tag, you know with him and Herps pretty much holding the value range until the bottom fell through when they spent on pit lane, I would I would really not, you know, jump off of these expectations of where these guys are at and stuff. So when we're looking at Pocono and we're looking at where people qualify and stuff, and yet again, uh, I mentioned it with the truck series, but especially in the Xfinity series and especially in the cup series, I think we're going to have guys hit the wall in practice and go to backup cars, okay? And then... We're going to basically be force-fed those guys with the low amount of laps that we're running and with needing to pretty much nail one lap leader. I would prioritize probably Allgaier, not just because he's ran here before, not just because he, he's won in 2018, but you know when we look at what we're, we're looking at, 
I, I think Allgaier is the favorite. Okay, when we're looking at the rest of the... Let me look at the salary that we got here. Like, when we look at... That's wild, Austin Hill's 10-5. I, I would put Allgaier as as the favorite in this race. Probably Custer, Hill, Almarola next. Those would probably be the main four guys that I would envision competing for the win. And I think Allgaier is probably the favorite entering this weekend. The fact that he's 10,000, that's actually pretty wild. Um, because I think he's probably the best play entering this race. Um, past that, you know, we'll see where people qualify. I mean, like I said, you can't make determinations of who's a good play and who's not a good play before qualifying. Like it saying, you know, oh, so-and-so, if he qualifies in the back or whatever, I'm interested. Like that, that doesn't do anything, you know? So, you know, we'll talk about it on live shows of where people are qualifying and where they end up, um, where they end up looking like they're going to fall in line in terms of, you know, being viable, being playable or not and stuff. Um, yeah, that's the, uh, that's the Xfinity series. So when we get to the cup series, this is my opinion for the Cup Series. I have two dra- we have a fork in the road and two drastically different opinions for where I'm at. One being, it's going to be like Pocono, it's going to be like spread out, it's going to be like Pocono, spread out, boring, and also I, well, that's the first one, okay? And that's the one I lean to, right? Maybe three fork in the roads. One thing I've been asked a lot this week, and I've heard it a lot, like I've been asked a lot, I know people are talking about it, this stupid, stupid, but they're running the super speedway package. God, this is they're not gonna be four by four entering these corners. Gentlemen, have you guys never watched a Brickyard 400 race? We we are not gonna have like pack racing here at Indy, okay? We're just not gonna be, you know, racing in a gigantic pack. Okay? That that is not that's not what's gonna happen, okay? Now, I can say that, and a result can also be true. The fork in the road that I'm looking at is how aggressive these drivers are forced to race. If they understand that, you know, we just came off Pocono, we see how wild they get in Pocono. We've seen in previous Indianapolis races, when we go back and look at these Cup Series guys and how dumb they are, you know, back at, I believe 2020 was the last one, we'll we'll roll... Yeah, because Harvick won the last one. When we look at these, just the last four races, okay? Tell of tell the tape. Now, 2017, you're going to be like, oh, you know, a bit of an anomaly. We were racing, you know, we ran out of lights. People are getting desperate, whatever. But when we, look at, when we look at these races here, yeah, sure. You know, Harvick starts 11th and wins the race. But when we start looking at where these people are starting, we're seeing a lot of place differential come through. We're seeing that pretty much in most of these races, we're getting at least over 10 DNFs, if I'm not mistaken. We're 8 here. We're certainly 10 here. More guys involved in the last lap crash. Back to round 9, 10. And then we have, like, the absolute, you know, God-tier race, which is my type of racing with, you know, good old Timmy Hill finishing, like, 12 or whatever. Real chance, and when you look back at these races specifically, and you look back at like the two situations of like when when Johnson blows the motor entering three, and then when he like cuts the grass in two, causing wrecks and stuff. So just because, like the, the super speedway package, like doesn't matter. Okay, they run that shit at Atlanta because they just don't want the cars going too fast. Okay, they're afraid of sending people into the air. You know. So like I'm I'm not very concerned or like honestly the fact that they are running a super speedway package does not even matter to me like that that is is null and void okay I don't care about that the issue comes from is that if these drivers understand that it's going to be difficult to pass and this car is probably going to keep teams a lot closer than in previous years which I mean we even saw at Pocono of people you know competing staying up there. Uh, maintain your own position up there. Like, I mean, Gillen and, and uh, no, like Nemechek and, and Zane Smith, you know, perfect example, you know, get different on strategy. They're both running top 15 when they get involved in an accident. There's a real chance that a lot of guys are very much live in this indie race, okay? And when we're looking at these restarts, we're looking at these lanes, like, everybody understands, like, the outside is just useless. We can't, we cannot use the outside lane. You are, you are pinching the wall so much out of these corners, and you have basically, like, a lane and a half to work with. My thing is, is what if we start getting a lot of situations like the Jimmy Johnson out of turn two hitting the grass? 
of like guys force themselves in there, making an accidental three wide. You know, they enter the corner. Guy in the bottom is is you know door bagging the guy in the middle. The guy in the middle is also going up, and they just ass plow or not even ass plow. They just fling a guy into the wall, right? Like the poor bastard on the outside lane has nowhere to go. He slams the concrete wall. And, no less, okay, Indy, you care about safety? Get out of here, brother, man. It's 2024. You guys don't want to put safety barriers on the track because it lowers the racing surface. Like, get the fuck out of here, okay? So I think there's a real chance we get some gigantic wrecks at Indy this, this weekend. And it's not due to the package. It's just due to, like, late race restarts. And that's not out of the realm of possibility after what we've seen at Pocono, after what we see, after what we've seen at Texas this year, after what we've seen at Nashville this year. I would lean towards place differential at Indy. On top of that, real chance that we get guys going to the rear and or people not taking qualifying times going to a backup car because they wreck in practice. I think that's a real situation and i and have and it has a real chance of happening this weekend because all it is is like you gotta like we are racing on concrete walls okay out of these corners these guys are not hitting they're not gonna hit the safer barrier this next gen car is not gonna hit the wall on the safer barrier they're if they're gonna be wide on a corner they're most likely gonna hit the concrete wall down the short shoots okay that is that's gonna break Toe links in the rear, and it's most likely going to force guys to go to a back car, even if the wreck isn't truly significant. I think they're going to miss Q. Okay? So I think realistically, we can have easily five guys starting in the back of this race for not even being able to take a Q time. Okay? I think that's pretty huge. Now, I've said all that. Those are my thoughts. My main thought, and the reason why I haven't said anything out, out loud or you know, regarding this up until now is because I would just, I want to wait till practice. Okay. Not in a sense of like, Oh, who's going to be good. Who's going to be bad. But I think we will get a better understanding of how this car is going to perform at this track. Once we see them in practice. Okay. If the dirty air is huge and I mean big mama, huge, like there's a lot of chance we can have guys hitting the wall of these corners just with the dirty air causing them to, you know, get tight, hit the wall get hit from behind, put in the wall. Like, I think truly, truly short shoot out of turn one, out of turn two, and in and out of three is going to be like the major points. Four, I'm not really concerned on. I think at that point on restarts, and most people are going to get stuff squared away. But I think, I think the short shoots are going to be absolutely wild. And if anybody is like decided to like leave the two by two lane and go on the inside lane and make it three wide, you're going to have guys who might not even be involved in crashes but yet again, if they're two by two and some guy forces it three, the guy on the outside line understands like, I'm either going to get thrown in the wall or I got to lift and get back in line. And they're just going to lose a ton of spots on the outside lane. And so we're going to have a lot of situations where guys are prioritizing the inside lane on the choose cone. We're most likely going to have the more risky or guys trying to gain positions on the outside lane. And there's a real chance since the inside is going to be so prioritized, you're going to have a lot of the good plays Choosing to be on the inside on restarts and actively giving up positions on the outside lane, causing, you know, less good drivers to potentially gain more positions on restarts just based on the fact they're going to be choosing the outside lane to gain position. People like Barry McDowell, you know, Priest, Stenhouse, AJ Allmendinger, people like that. I don't even know if AJ's racing this weekend. Uh, let's see, is he even in the race? He is. Uh, like when, when we start looking at this mid tier you know, group of drivers, these are people that I would think would be able to take advantage of the chaos on these restarts and stuff. And so part of me, like if I see stuff in practice, which even, even then it's going to be very difficult, unless teams are actively like, yeah, you know what, we're going to go out there as a group and see what happens. I just, I, I don't think we're going to get a real understanding of what this race is going to be, even with practice, okay? So there is... There is a part of me, and also, when we're speaking out loud of where crashes are going to happen, the, this is a race where crashes will happen in the front. I don't foresee these idiots killing themselves for like 27th. It just makes, this makes no sense to do that. I think this is a race to where when you're forcing it three wide, when I'm saying the positions of like, you know, somebody's getting forced in the wall or forced to lift and stuff, that is going to be happening up front, Okay. So it's a high percentage that it's going to involve lap leaders. It's a high percentage that it's going to involve favorites. 
there is a part of me that is, you know, a bit interested in, you know, prioritizing guys in the back of the field, especially when it's people like somebody like Justin Haley, Cody Ware, you know, the Rick Ware cars who are practically, you know, in RFK light cars who have shown speed, who are not going to be truly in danger, who can gain positions in this race by pure survival and stuff. So a lot of question marks around Indy that, you know, I I, I want to see practice. I want to see where everybody's starting. I want to I want to get a feel for how these cars are going to race before I'm like, oh, this is Talladega Light, or this is just Pocono again. You know, if anything, I think it'll probably be in the middle of what we saw last week at Pocono and closer to guys getting absolutely stupid. Um, but I'm pro- I'm in the stance of probably 8 to 12 cars are not going to finish this race. And if we start getting more in the range of 11, 12, 13 cars DNFing, it's going to prioritize place differential far, far more. Okay? And that was just, you know... I mean, look, look at where the guys that are starting these races are finishing. Logano starts first. You know, we have one, two, three guys who start in the top 10 in the final race in 2020 here, last year finish up there. You know, when we look at the race in 2019, you have one, two, let me see, you have, let me go to finish actually, so I'll re, you have one, two, three, four, five, but like Menard going from second to 10th is pretty much dead, but when you look at all the place differential plays coming through and who these guys are coming through the field, you know, guys, I doubt, I don't know if we have, we don't, I was hoping we'd have data of someone going to the rear, or it's, I, I hate that race and reference remove that, because we used to have, like, guys, remember back in the day when, when we would have comments on the bottom of these pages and stuff of, like, oh, so-and-so went to the rear and things like that, you know, we look at 2018 and where these guys started, like, 2018, you know, clearly not as insane, okay, a lot more guys from the top half of the field, but at this point, you know, we're looking at, like, you know, long, long time ago. And then, you know, the absolute, like, insane banana wreck fest in 2017. I'm, uh, I, I am, I'm very, very interested in seeing how these guys race, seeing what the teams are saying, um, and seeing how they're at. The fact that they're running the Super Speedway package, honestly, it has no, I would be very pissed off if they weren't using that because they're back at the Oval because people were like, oh, man, the Indy, f- you know, the Brick Air 400 is boring. There's not enough passes and stuff. That, so they're like, okay, we're going to try and do our best to try and keep these guys closer together. It's it's not going to be, you know, just a square of cars going down the back straightaway into three. This is just to try and keep people closer than normal. But it's not going to be a, a, a Super Speedway package, okay? Because I don't know I don't know if you guys know this, but you have to brake at Indy in these cars. You don't just stay full throttle at Indianapolis, okay? So, like, um, you know, we'll see what practice does. We'll see how 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 people are feeling and stuff like that. I'm not not really sold on anything. Don't really have a true opinion on that. I don't think I don't think it's worth any more time putting towards that. Let's just see what people are saying once we get to Saturday's practice, once we get to Sunday morning, and and everything like that. Uh, past that, I'll be live. Tomorrow, Friday for the Truck Series, Saturday for the Xfinity Series, and Sunday for the Brickyard 400, and I will see you guys later, so best of luck, and I'll see you guys live shows.